doing a whiskey tasting with first timers, store picks, barrel picks, sour mashes, and more. These are just a few of the topics that we are going to talk about in today's Q&A episode of the Whiskey Noobs podcast. But before we get started, for those of you who are new here, my name is Chris and I am the host of the show. Today's episode, as I mentioned, is a Q&A, FAQ, whatever you want to call it episode where I answer questions from listeners just like you. There are a couple of ways that you can submit your questions. So the first way would be to submit a question through my Instagram at whiskey underscore noobs. Every Wednesday, I post a question sticker to my story, and you're able to click on that sticker, submit your question, and then I will potentially answer it on the show. Um, I try to pick out the most interesting or the best ones because we just can't fit quite all of them on the show. And that leads me to the second way to submit a question, which would be through Patreon. If you join any of the three Patreon tiers, you are able to submit questions to a suggestion box where I will then have those questions on the show. All patron questions will be answered prior to answering Instagram questions, and that is simply because patrons are paying to support the show. It makes this whole deal a whole lot easier to do, and I'm assuming patrons are the most invested in the show since they're paying to support it. So thank you so much to all the patrons out there, and if you have a couple minutes to go check out that Patreon, it's going to cost you about the cost of getting a glass of whiskey at a restaurant once a month, and it is super helpful to me. I'm so grateful to all the patrons that we already have, and if you're just following on Instagram, that's totally fine too and I'm going to try to incorporate as many of those questions as I can as well because speaking of which the questions lately have been fantastic you guys have been really killing it so it was hard to choose hard to narrow down for today so I do have a couple extra long form questions which are questions that I will answer over the course of a minute two minutes whatever and then I also have lightning round questions which I answer quickly Uh, usually there's less long form questions than today but you guys have been really killing it with the questions lately I enjoyed all these questions uh, and I wanted to answer them as fully as time will allow me to so Before we get to those questions, let's do a mystery whiskey review, which I do on episodes where we don't have a full whiskey review. I'm going to give you a few notes from a whiskey that I'm drinking, and you can try to guess it yourself. On the nose, this whiskey is bright, it's fruity, it's got a little bit of a creaminess to it, and then on the palate, it's even more fruity. I'm getting a lot of like a fresh, ripe fruit. That's all that you're going to get for right now, but you'll probably get a little bit more later on in the episode, and hopefully that can help you guess the whiskey that I'm tasting. I failed to mention earlier, but this is a whiskey that has been on the show. Specifically, it has been one of our last 10 review episodes, so episodes where we did a full review of a whiskey. It's been one of the last 10 of those episodes so take your best shot at it no shame in getting it wrong but i just think it's a little bit of fun to try to guess it but without further ado let's get to your guys's questions so the first question we have this month is i'm doing my own whiskey tasting with first timers any advice So there's actually an episode going to be coming up next week where I'm going to walk through a whiskey tasting a little bit more in depth. It's the type of episode that I'm probably going to start doing more frequently. That episode, if you haven't already done your tasting by then, might be helpful for you. But let me break it down a little bit in terms of what I, specifically for the first timers, what I would try to do with the tasting. First things first, the types of whiskey that you're going to taste. I would not get into the high proof selections. I probably wouldn't even go under over 100 proof unless there's somebody that is doing the tasting and is like, I'm really just, this is too weak for me. That's pretty rare amongst first timers, but if it's the case, then maybe you can crank up the proof a little bit. The second thing for me is anytime somebody is new to whiskey and they want to actually do tastings, they want to try multiple different types, I want to give them a variety. I do not want to give them three bourbons that all kind of taste the same. I know there's a big variety of bourbon out there. You don't have to tell me that. If you look behind me in any of my videos, you know that I know that. But there's even more variety outside of bourbon out there. So if it was first timers for me, I would probably do, at the very minimum, I'd probably do a bourbon, an Irish, and a scotch, and maybe a rye as well. But rye can be a little bit harsh for some first timers. On that same note, for some people... Everything else is too boring, and rye is more exciting. It's more bright. It's more spicy. And so I would keep rye kind of in my back pocket, but at the very minimum, I would do a bourbon and either a scotch or an Irish whiskey and go from there. I would like to do a bourbon, a scotch, and an Irish whiskey. So I'm going to give them some variety. 
and mind you that especially if you have a large selection at home, you can then tailor what they try next based on their reactions to those two or three. If they try bourbon and they don't like it, they say that just burns too much, and then they try scotch, and they're like, oh, that's more my league, then go maybe something even milder. If the reverse happens, they try the scotch, and they're like, oh, I just don't, I don't, usually people don't, especially if they're new, they don't just straight up say, well, this is too boring for me because they don't know that yet. But they might try the scotch and be like, ugh, I, it just has a flavor I'm not a big fan of and it burns, I don't know. And then if you give them a bourbon, they're like, oh, now that makes more sense. It still burns, it's still spicy, but the flavor is there. There's really those two kind of routes that people can tend to go down, especially when they're new. Uh, you can see this in some of the early episodes I have with my friends on, where you can see they are, they're not into whiskey. This definitely happened with Bryce in the Tullamore Dew versus Russell's Reserve 10-year episode. He... We had Tolmore Dew, which is one of the easiest to drink whiskeys out there. And he tried it in the budget range, I should say. He tried it and he was like, eh, I just don't know. It's just something about it I'm not a big fan of. And he just was too new to whiskey to know that he needed to say, this is too boring. Then I gave him Russell's Reserve, which is spicier, it's bolder, it's way more body. And he's like, oh, now this makes way more sense. This burns me more, but it's also more like a delicacy. It's a little bit more, uh, there's more to it. I forget exactly what his words were, but he just, he really seemed to lean that way. And so you'll see people go one of those two directions, typically. So give them some variety, see what direction they go. If you have the selection at home, then tailor that selection to them. If you don't, then maybe just give them a little bit more of the one that they liked and talk to them about different routes they could go, different things they could try based on your experience. And that's a really, really great way to get your friends into the hobby if they want to get into the hobby. You know, that's something that is lost on me sometimes, and I was even thinking about the other day is... It's very lucky for those of us who collect. Our friends are very lucky that they get to try our stuff. And if you want them to get into the hobby, the best thing you can do is to share your selection with them. Um, most people don't have the opportunity to do a tasting of a scotch, a bourbon, an Irish whiskey all in one sitting for free if you're not charging your friends. Um, so you're a vital resource in that regard. So make sure you're trying to tailor it to them and make it as enjoyable as it can be for them. That way they're getting the most out of the tasting and you're not just wasting whiskey. Uh, the other advice that I would give, and this is my last little bit here, would be don't be afraid to walk them through a few tips on how to make it burn less. Um, keeping it in their mouth a little bit longer and not just gulping it down, that's a big one. People think if you swallow it faster, it'll burn less, but that's not the case because your saliva doesn't get to dilute it at all, and then you just feels like there's fire going down your throat. Also, you can have them put a droplet of water in it or take a sip of water and then take a sip of their whiskey while there's still a little bit of water in their mouth. That can dilute it a little bit. That can help things out. Typically... Just based on my experience, I find that most people think ice is going to make it easier to drink, and it doesn't, um, and so I would stray away from ice personally. I find it's a lot easier to learn to appreciate the whiskey without ice in it, mainly because you get more flavor, and without the flavor, new people tend to just get the burn. That's just in my experience, but that's the way that I have seen it happen a lot of the time. So personally, I would stick to neat Glen Cairns aren't a necessity, although they might help make your friends a little bit more interested. Uh, and go from there, and hopefully your tasting goes well. But next week, I'm going to do a, a really good breakdown of a tasting that I think is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and really, for me and for the audience who's been listening for a while, flex those muscles of properly going through a tasting, not just tasting something and giving the notes. Which is nothing wrong with that, but I want to do the, the in-depth style of tasting. Moving on to the next question. I combined these two uh, for a specific reason. So somebody said, what exactly is a store pick? And then somebody else said, are we going to see a Whiskey Noobs barrel pick in the future? So obviously I combined these because store picks and barrel picks are kind of the same thing. A store pick means that a store goes to a distillery, gets their hands on a barrel, buys the entire barrel, has it put into bottles by the distiller usually, and then they sell all of those bottles through their store and it is a single barrel that cannot be bought anywhere else because that store bought that barrel. So no two barrels taste exactly alike. Theoretically, you'll never get a whiskey that will taste like that store pick. So that's commonly done. 
And then barrel picks are basically the same thing, except influencers such as myself do barrel picks. Um, some people have like Facebook clubs where they'll do barrel picks and divide it up amongst the club. Like the whole Facebook club will buy all of the bottles from that barrel. Um, and then also like in the state of Ohio, you don't have privately owned stores. So the state of Ohio will do barrel picks and then sell those bottles. So that's what a store pick, barrel pick, etc. means. Now, to address the second half of that question, are we going to see a Whiskey Noobs barrel pick in the future? Yes, and there's one coming very soon, actually. Um, so it's in the works right now. We're selecting the barrel, and then there's, of course, going to be a couple of months of leeway while they bottle it, put our stickers on it, etc. But long story short, make sure you are following the Instagram and the TikTok. And if you can get on the Patreon, then you're going to get first dibs on the barrel, so I would personally do that. If you're not on the email list, you're probably going to get second dibs on the barrel. So I would do that if I was you. But email list and Patreon are the best ways to get your hands on that Whiskey Noobs barrel pick. That'll be coming up here very shortly. I'm not 100% sure if as of the airing of this episode, I have announced the distiller yet. So I'm not going to say it in this episode, (laughs) but it will definitely be announced on TikTok, Instagram, Patreon, all of those places. So that's going to be the first of many, hopefully, barrel picks. They're a lot of fun. You guys listen to me review whiskey all day long. If you like my opinion on whiskey and you think I usually agree with what you think about whiskey, then this is me picking out a barrel and saying this is the type of thing that I like. And so if you agree with me, then you're probably going to like it as well. That's the fun of it. And I'm super duper excited to be working on that barrel pick. So should be coming out here very shortly. But let's move on to the next question for now. What is the relationship between bourbon quality and Rickhouse storage floor slash area? So by Rickhouse storage floor slash area, I'm guessing you mean where, like location in the Rickhouse. So for those of you who don't know, a Rickhouse or a warehouse is where all the barrels go. And depending on where a whiskey, a bourbon, whatever type of whiskey you have is stored while it's aging, it will have different characteristics. Now, I wouldn't say that this determines the bourbon quality. Uh, it definitely changes the characteristics of the bourbon, but I there's no hard and fast rule. Top floor means best quality. Bottom floor means best quality. There's no rule for that, but it will absolutely impact the characteristics of the bourbon. So a good example of this is a lot of times if you're going to age a bourbon for a very long time, you're going to want it on a lower floor of your rickhouse. The reason for this is the lower floor is going to see less temperature fluctuation between summer and winter, and because of that, it's going to expand and contract into the barrel less, and you're going to lose less to evaporation. What this mostly comes down to is temperature swings. As it gets hotter, as the barrel expands, the whiskey expands and goes into that barrel, it's going to interact a lot with that wood. And then when it cools down, all that's going to kind of contract, you can imagine, and squeeze that whiskey back out of that barrel, and then it's going to happen over and over again as the whiskey ages. So as I mentioned, the more you have that, you're also going to lose some to evaporation. You're also going to lose that, that angel's share that's going to make your whiskey a lot of times stronger, not always, but usually. And so that climate is going to have a big impact on the whiskey. So I can't say it's going to make any one better or worse than the other. It will change how much barrel characteristic you get. Typically, if it's on the top floor, you're seeing temperature swings back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's going into that barrel, out of that barrel, into that, into the actual wood, like soaking into it, out of it. And that is creating much more barrel characteristic in the whiskey. So you're going to have more of that spice, that wood, that vanilla, those sorts of things that you get from barrels. This isn't always the case, but it just sometimes is the case. And so the reason that it might get associated with quality is because sometimes it's associated with age. Uh, Specifically, this happens, I know for sure, uh, Buffalo Trace does this with the Weller lineup. They, when they're aging it longer, they put it on a lower floor, so it's seeing less of that expansion and contraction, and you keep you retain more of the whiskey over the years as it continues to go, and it doesn't just become super tannic, super bitter barrel characteristics. Uh, you don't have so much of that expansion and contraction, but you are able to then age it longer. The reverse can be true. You can have a young whiskey that sees a ton of that and actually ends up getting a lot of barrel characteristics because it's going into and out of the barrel. So, not really an impact on quality, 
but definitely an impact on profile, barrel characteristics, the the overall smell and taste of the whiskey. Absolutely, it will have an impact on it. But it it's so variable that it's hard to really even nail down. The general thing I would say is temperature swings are the big difference, basically. Moving on to the next question. What do I think about Emerald Giant Rye and the Grizzly? So for those of you who don't know, these this person is asking about two releases from Redwood Empire. Emerald Giant Rye, which is one of their base three lineup. Unless they're confusing it with Rocky Top, because that's a rye that recently came out. Rocket Top, not Rocky Top. And they're talking about Grizzly Beast. So Rocket Top and Grizzly Beast are two of their more recent releases from M- uh, Redwood Empire. And then Emerald Giant is one of the three main releases. Um... But all this is to say that I do really enjoy Redwood Empire stuff, and there is an episode coming up where we will have their master distiller and their head distiller both on, and I've actually already recorded that. It's already ready to go. I just have to edit it. It will most likely be episode 99, so if you want to learn more about Redwood Empire, where they came from, what they stand for, and what they're producing right now, then you can listen to that episode. The cliff notes for the person asking about Emerald Giant Rye and Grizzly Beast. I liked Emerald Giant Rye. It was a little bit more rye than my personal palate. If you like rye, if you like rye-forward things, you're probably going to like it. Grizzly Beast, on the other hand, I thought was kind of like a... Kind of, not entirely, but kind of like a stronger version of Pipe Dream, which I already love. And so you add in a little bit more strength. It's bottled in bond, and I really, really enjoy it. So Grizzly Beast, I was a big fan of. Um, Emerald Rye, I could see, I could understand why somebody would like it if they really liked rye. And I think when I'm in the mood for a rye, it's going to be way up there uh, with some of the other bottles that I have. In general, Redwood Empire seems to be putting out some pretty good stuff. So you can learn a lot more about that. We had a great conversation. I learned a lot of good stuff in the upcoming episode, which most likely will be episode 99 if everything goes according to plan. The next question, do I ever test old-fashioned recipes or do I just review whiskeys? So I mostly do whiskey reviews, but I wanted to bring this up because I love a good old-fashioned. So if you guys want more old-fashioned recipes, please let me know and I will start to do more old-fashioned type content. Um, I did do an episode on Old Fashioned specifically and I want to say that was episode 73, but let me look that up right now. Uh, let's go to the episode list and it was 73 that was good memory uh so episode 73 i had chris from bourbon of the week on and he had an old-fashioned recipe that he came up with that was my favorite old-fashioned recipe that i've probably probably had to date i might have improved it a little bit we'll see um but it was a great old-fashioned recipe and i like old fashions i like If you want something a little bit more spicy, I like a little bit of rye. If you want something a little bit more sweet, I like a little bit of bourbon. If you want something that's going to show the whiskey a lot better, I like just simple syrup or sugar. If you want something that's going to be more desserty, I like to use a brown sugar or a maple syrup or something like that. So that's what I like about old fashions is you can really tailor them to what kind of a mood you're you're in or what kind of a palate you have. And that can be a lot of fun to kind of turn each of those knobs a little separately. And then of course you've got different bitters that are going to give you all kinds of different old fashions. You got, you got just your go-to Angostura bitters. You've got, um, sassafras bitters. I used once, uh, orange bitters, cherry bitters, chocolate bitters, all different kinds of bitters that you can use to give you all different flavor palettes. And I really enjoy that. Um, so if you want more old fashioned content, yeah, let me know. I like old fashions. I'm happy to talk about them a bit more, but I do, most of what I do is is definitely the actual reviews of whiskeys. Speaking of whiskey, let's move on to the next question. We've got, I'm not sure what Sour Mash is. Have you reviewed and or recommend one to try first? So, Sour Mash is... I actually realized after seeing this question, I was looking some stuff up online, and I, I realized there's a little bit of confusion, I think, about Sour Mash. Um mainly because I saw a bunch of articles saying sour mash versus bourbon. And that is similar to the type of articles that say bourbon versus whiskey, where it confuses people. And it makes people think, well, you have to either be a bourbon or a whiskey. You have to either be a sour mash or a bourbon. I don't like that it makes it seem that way because that's not the case. 
what a sour mash is, a, a whiskey made with a sour mash, means that they are taking some of the last mash. So let me let me start at the beginning here. When you make a whiskey, you make a mash, a mixture of all the different ingredients. You ferment that mash, then you put it into a still and you distill it. A sour mash takes a little bit of the already fermented or fermenting mash from the last run and puts it into the brand new mash of this run to kick off that fermentation. If you've ever made like an Amish friendship bread, uh, this is the same idea. So you make this bread and you take a little bit extra of the like dough or batter or whatever you want to call it. And you use that to make the next bread and you can give it away to people. And then everybody's making this bread using a little tiny bit of the original bread that you made. That This is that same exact idea. You're just doing it with whiskey. So you take a little bit of that fermenting batch from the last run, you put it into this mash, and that kickstarts this mash. Now, the reason I say that it's not different from bourbon is because bourbons can be made using a sour mash. Uh, I just visited Maker's Mark, and I didn't even know this, but they use a sour mash process. They take a little bit of their mash, and they put it into the next batch. So it's not a, a sour mash or bourbon. It's just you can have a bourbon that is a sour mash, or you can have a whiskey that's a sour mash that's not a bourbon, etc. But that's basically what a sour mash means. And according to Google, typically one quarter to one third of the mash is, of the new mash is old mash. Of this run's mash is made from last run's mash. Um, that's just according to Google, though. So typically one quarter to one third. Now sour mash is very common. Uh, it's very common in the bourbon industry. It's very common with whiskeys in general. Uh, one whiskey that you may or may not have heard of, just kind of, you know, a little kickstart brand you may or may not have heard of is Jack Daniels. Uh, they use a sour mash. So Jack Daniels is a sour mash. As I mentioned, I just visited Maker's Mark. They are a sour mash. And Michter's makes one that is like specifically Michter's sour mash, which I don't think I've had. Um, but at any rate, it's very common, so I, I don't just specifically review sour mashes, but you can take a look. If you just look up bourbons that are made with a sour mash, you'll probably be able to find it, uh, find quite a few. But uh, there are some that, you know, that's kind of what they claim to be. Like, that's like their claim to fame is like, I'm a sour mash. Kind of like how with scotches, you know, you got a lot of scotches that are finished in sherry oak, and there are some scotches that that's like their claim to fame. They put it right in the name, the Macallan 12-year sherry oak. Same kind of idea with sour mash. Some people just don't even like really mention it, and then some people that's like the brand of it is that it's a sour mash. So, a little bit of um, confusion I think there nowadays, thanks to these articles that try to be clickbaity and then they just confuse people. Not a big fan of that, but that's what a sour mash means. Now I'm going to do another quick tasting of this mystery whiskey, and then we're gonna go into the lightning round. So that sip was actually a little bit more grassy than I remember this one being, but still very bright fruit forward, very um, very fruity, almost a little bit sour candy y right there, which isn't something I don't think I don't think it's something I said in the episode where I reviewed it, but I got a little bit of it there. Bright fruit, I would say the type of fruit you might get in an orchard, like orchard fruits, um, very a little bit pale. I don't want to say very pale because that bright fruit really ba balances it out nicely. A little bit pale, uh, and that's all I feel comfortable saying. Otherwise, I'm just going to give it away, but I will give it away at the end. So let's move on to our lightning round questions. Number one, what is – I'm going to take this lightning round a little bit slower, actually, because I selected less of them now that I'm not forcing myself to answer every single question anymore. I can actually slightly give you guys slightly uh, better answers in the lightning round. So what's your day job? I am a mechanical engineer, specifically in automotive, although my college degree is in aerospace systems engineering. Uh, but my day job is mechanical engineering, which is fairly similar, except obviously uh, it doesn't have wings. Moving on to the next question. What is my favorite Weller? I'm going to assume you mean from like the main lineup because I've never had the uh, Weller from the antique collection. And some people include that. Some people don't. Uh, William LaRue Weller, that is. So I would say probably my favorite Weller is Foolproof. Probably. 
I based that on one tasting that I did of all of them side by side, and I really enjoyed the Full Proof the most at that time. And as of right now, uh, the only ones I have regularly are Special Reserve and Antique, and I just got a bottle of Full Proof. I would say Full Proof is probably still my favorite as of right now, but I'd have to retry the, you know, the single barrel, the CYPB, the 12 year. Um, but at the time, Full Proof was my favorite. I was lucky enough to get my hands on a bottle, and I would say it's probably still my favorite. You can see episode 69 for a full breakdown of my thoughts of the Weller li- lineup based on that tasting that I did. Next question, what's 9 plus 10? 21, because I'm cultured. That's my only answer to that. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, Google it, I guess. <laughs> the next question, my favorite flavored whiskey. I would guess... I don't know for sure, but I think my favorite flavored whiskey is probably Wild Turkey American Honey Sting. That's not Wild Turkey American Honey, not to be confused. This is Wild Turkey American Honey Sting. It has a spiciness to it. I forget if it's like ghost pepper or jalapeno or whatever, but it's one of those peppers, apparently. But I just like that it has a little bit of that spiciness to it. Um, I don't enjoy a lot of whiskeys on the rocks. I do enjoy this one on the rocks because it's cold, and you get that little bit of spiciness with the cold, and it's I enjoy it quite a bit. Haven't had it in a while, but a, a Wild Turkey American Honey Sting. I like that. So that that was one that I was into kind of a while ago and I haven't had a bottle of for a while so I I might have to go get myself a bottle next question wondering if you've considered doing a podcast about Texas bourbons Uh, I would absolutely consider that so maybe I will look into that a little bit more I have done a Texas single malt which was Balconis um, but I don't have any Texas bourbons at the moment so that was a single malt not a bourbon Um, I did have that on the show a while ago Uh, around last February, so almost exactly a year ago. Uh, But I haven't had any Texas bourbons on the show that I'm aware of, so maybe I will do an episode on that. Next question, where and who did my awesome merch, and then this person asked in the same response, should Woodford jump on the bottled and bond train? So two questions here. The first is I use a drop shipper for some of my merch, and like the glasses, the Glen Cairns, they're handmade at the moment, or made by me, I should say. Um, I buy the blank Glen Cairns, and then I do the etching myself. That will likely change soon as volumes continue to go up. I can no longer keep up with making them by hand. Um, so that might change soon, but um, I will be sourcing somebody to get those. And all all the shirts and some of the hats are all drop shippers. So they make it all and they ship it out to you. The next Part of that question, should Woodford jump on the bottled and bond train? I like bonded whiskeys. Um, a lot of the time I like that they're usually relatively inexpensive, but you get that 100 proof. You get a little bit of heat, which is usually more than you get in bonded price ranges because a lot of times you're like 80 or 90 proof. So with bonded, you get that 100 proof. And I would definitely be interested if Woodford came up with one. Next question, do I have any pets? I do. I have a boxador, like a boxer black lab mix. His name is Ghost, and he just turned a year old in January. Next question, am I a fan of Henry McKenna? I'm assuming you mean the 10-year-old bonded because that's like the rare one that people care about. Um, Yes, I liked it. I tried it one time at a restaurant, and to me it gave me like this s'mores vibe. I really enjoyed that. I'm hoping to get my hands on a bottle soon, maybe give you guys a full review. But Cliff Notes, yeah, I did enjoy it quite a bit. The next question, this person says they just bought a bottle of Jefferson Ocean. Have I tried it? Yes, I have. Um, I like it, but I've heard really bad things about other voyages. Some people like the trash on it who've only had one voyage. And the whole point is they do these voyages that are all these different places. So not only are you getting different barrels, but we just talked about how important the climate is on the barrel, on the aging. And they're aging it on a boat in all these different areas with different voyages. So they're all going to taste pretty different. Some people crap on the whole Jefferson series because they have a bad voyage. I will not do that. I almost think that's kind of the point. The point is different voyages taste super different. So I think it's a very cool idea. If nothing else, it's fantastic marketing. And I have had a couple of them, and I I didn't think they were bad at all. Are they overpriced? Maybe, but I thought they were good at the very least. The next question, what's my favorite drink to mix with whiskey? I am a simple guy when it comes to mixed drinks. If we're not talking about like nice cocktails, whiskey sour, um, old fashioned, stuff like that. If we're just talking about a mixed drink, I'm a simple guy. I love a Jack and Coke, a Jack and Ginger Ale, especially at a bar just because most bars have Jack. 
Um, I also liked one I got a while back called a Kentucky Dirty. It was at a bar up in northwestern Ohio, and it was, I believe, uh, either Coke or Pepsi, um, ginger ale, a little bit of amaretto, and then whiskey. And that was pretty good as well. It was a little bit different. That amaretto sweetened it up like you might imagine, so you can't do too much of it. But I thought that was pretty cool as well. Next question, what is my favorite less expensive smoky flavored scotch? Really depends what you mean by less expensive. Um, Ardbeg 10-year and Lafroy 10-year are both uh, pretty good and not overly expensive, but I'm assuming you mean like budget budget, and in that area, I would say Johnny Walker Black. It has a good smokiness to it. Somewhere in between, you've got Johnny Walker Double Black, which is also pretty smoky. So um, I think those can kind of introduce you to the smokiness without being overwhelmingly smoky. Next question, R and R Reserve. I'm assuming you mean rich and rare, if I remember correctly. Uh, have I tried it yet? I'm fairly certain I tried it actually on a Q&A episode, I think. Um, but I definitely remember liking it for how cheap it was. I thought it had that nice general sweetness uh, to it. And so overall, I mean, I think it was like $10. So not bad for 10 bucks. And the last question for today, we've got the Scotch Madness Bracket. What is the prep or research time for that? I am glad you asked. So it doesn't take a whole lot of prep, fortunately enough, or research, I should say. Fortunately enough, as I continue to do this, less and less research is necessary because there's a lot of things I've learned along the way. The prep, I would say, was probably, you know, it took me a little while to get the bracket set up. Not very long, maybe an hour. Set up the bracket, figure out how I wanted to seed it, how I wanted to put all those together. And then um, actually filming and recording it, th those take time. I mean, recording any video, the actual recording is the least problematic part. That's maybe 15 minutes to record the video. But, you know, setting it up, uh, setting up the blind tastings in a way that I can't see them, asking my wife to do them, and then editing them. Editing takes, like, the majority of the time. Um, so, I don't know, maybe an hour per video approximately between the recording, the editing, the posting. Um, I'm going to say maybe an hour per video. That's just a complete guess that I'm just coming up with as I'm talking here. But I'm glad you asked because people do forget that these things take quite a bit of time. And this is most of my, if not all of my free time, uh, which is why I am so grateful to the patrons and to the people who rate and review the show and the people who like and follow and share things on their stories because it makes all of this worth it. This is very time consuming. So thank you for actually asking about what goes into this sort of a thing. Scotch Madness bracket in particular, though, um, definitely took a little bit more time because I had to put it together, had to try to be clever about how I was going to do it, decide how I wanted the videos to be formatted, those sort of a thing. Uh, but hopefully that was quality content for you guys because I felt like I learned a lot from it. I'm really hoping you guys did as well. But that is all of the questions for today. So let's take a minute, let's finish up this mystery review, and then we're going to get out of here. All right, let's round it all out here. This whiskey, it's got a lot of bright fruit, a tiny bit of spiciness, kind of a creaminess that I would call maltiness. It's got a little bit of a grassiness to it with that maltiness. And that fruit is bright. It's a little bit tropical. It's a little bit um, maybe along the lines of like a stone fruit or like an apple, like I said, your orchard fruits. Um, and then maybe just a touch of like a tropical fruit. If you haven't guessed it, this one hopefully was a little bit easier than others. This is the Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve that we had on one, two, three, four, five review episodes ago. So hopefully you guys were able to guess it. If not, better luck next time. But that is the blind tasting for today's episode. I wanted to try it again because I really enjoyed it and... I thought, you know, sometimes they're gimmicky when you do those fancy finishes, and I didn't think this was gimmicky. I thought it was tasty. It's got a pretty solid balance to it. Just a touch of that spice. Maybe it needs a little bit more kick to it. I don't know, but very enjoyable to say the least. So you can hear that full episode. Um, it's the episode that has Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve right there in the title. That is all that I've got for this episode today, though, guys. So thank you all for listening. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Please, if you want to submit your question, go join the Patreon or go to over to the Instagram on a Wednesday, and you can submit your question. And I will answer it right here on the show if it makes it in all those questions because there are just too many to fit into an episode. That's all we've got for today, guys. I will leave you with learn to drink, drink to learn. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review to help grow the show and get the word out. You can also find more Whiskey Noobs content on Instagram at whiskey underscore noobs and on TikTok at whiskey noobs podcast. If you want to drink right along with me, make sure to join the email list by sending an email to whiskey noobs podcast at gmail.com with a subject line saying email list. You will receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of time and drink right along with the show. Once again, thanks for listening to this episode. The Whiskey Noobs podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.